Okay, our guest speaker tonight is Dr. Kendra Sundquist. Yep, I'll get out of your way in a minute. <laughs> That's right. Um, Kendra's career um, began as a trainee nurse in the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, and since then she has worked in many positions uh, and in many areas. She has worked in sexual and reproductive health, HIV, AIDS and cancer. Um, as the Director of Education and Family Planning, New South Wales managed nurses and GP certificate programs, community programs and education for WHO and AusAid in China. Uh, Kendra is at the Cancer Council at the moment. No, you were at the Cancer Council, that's right. You're at COTA. Yeah. Doing uh, at work. Terrific. Uh, Kendra has also worked for the Cancer Council uh, and worked in the role of uh, research educating health professionals in psychological, uh, no, psychosocial care. That's right. Um, certainly, you've had a, a very good career. You've got to those, a long one. Uh, you've been appointed to boards, which is a great indication you've really got to the top of the pack. <laughs> and. Uh, it's a, it's really good that you've uh, now gone to doing some voluntary work and some consulting. Uh, Kendra's going to speak to us on depression. Now, depression is a subject that I think's touched many of us here. Um, Kendra is happy to take questions as she goes through the meeting. So, talking about depression, I guess it's going to be quite a wide-ranging subject and uh, when people ask questions, you never quite know where these uh, talks go. And I guess you'll be also uh, touching on anxiety, which now seems to be linked very much with depression. And uh, we can all ask all those questions that uh, we've never been game to ask anyone else. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, would you please uh, welcome Kendra tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. It makes me feel tired when I think about it because I, I, I actually um, realised I'd been working in the health area for 52 years suddenly the other day and uh, that's a very long time but I have to say it's been a fascinating journey and obviously I'm still enjoying it because of the age of 73 I'm still I'm still out there teaching and I do, I do like uh, very much the interaction with people and hope that I can make some sort of a difference. Um, so when I heard about this program that's funded by Beyond Blue, um, I was very keen to take a, you know, a part of it and, and we've had um, a really interesting time, I've had a really interesting time working with Council on the Ageing, they're a very um, good organisation. And um, we, did a, we did a road tour just recently down south, which was really interesting with one of the people from Council on the Ageing. And we stopped all the way from, uh, I think it was uh, Naruma, all the way up. And the Probus clubs, community um, groups. And uh, I suppose what struck me about that was you know, when people retire and get a bit older, they think that they'll just go off down to the beach and will go away from their family and friends. And, and um, that's fine when everything's going well, but it, the stories were quite sad, really, because, you know, they lost a partner. And um, although I have to say, it seemed to be the community was very welcoming and, um, and not welcoming, was very um, close-knit and supportive. So, I mean, that's the good thing. But, you know, we all think that you just go off at, as you get older and go to retirement down the, in the mountains or somewhere. But there are some prices to pay for that, I suppose. And the other thing that struck me um, was some of the Vietnam veterans that attended the meetings. And uh, this just sticks in my mind, um, really. Uh, this man said, the thing that he remembers most and feels the saddest thing about, and he still has nightmares about it, is when he got off the plane having fought for his country, he was spat on at the airport. So, you know, you see, then you realise that people just carry these experiences with them um, for a very, very long time, and some, you know, don't ever really get out over it. So, obviously, the experience of cancer is something that I do know something about because um, I've had cancer myself. Uh, my husband died of lung cancer and my best friend died of breast cancer and I've lost numerous other friends along the way and family members. So cancer is, um, is a very challenging disease but I mean the good news is and having worked at the Cancer Council for 12 years, um, actually 
one of the things, my main role there, apart from when I started there doing educating the doctors, because we ran the basic science of oncology course there for um, oncology registrars, but that went to the Cancer Institute. But I, I developed a lot of uh, resources. That was my role, main role for um, patients and carers. And uh, all the understanding cancer books that you see out there was all under my watch. Um, all the DVDs, um, everything else that um, in terms of information and support, all the programs, Living Well After Cancer was developed by me. Um, I just don't want to do a whole rant, but um, you know, I was very much involved in supportive care. And I know that two of my um, proteges uh, ended up going to work for the prostate cancer for a while. <laughs> They're not neither of them now, but they enjoyed it very much. Um, so uh, this, uh, anxiety and depression talk is very um, much an important aspect of cancer because anxiety and depression are very common and I don't think it necessarily gets addressed as well as it should although Beyond Blue is a great organisation and I've got a, a whole lot of um, great information for, he, for you here tonight to take away um, which will be just very relevant to what I'm talking about and um, Anyway, I'll uh, start and um, how common is it in the community? Well, it's more common than we think. Um, as you'll see, you can see it quite clearly there. A million Australians each year, each year experience a depressive illness of some sort. And of course, there are different types of depressive illness, but um, so I won't go into that at the moment. But um, over two million people currently have an anxiety disorder and that's like every year about, about you know, roughly these things are sort of estimated. But the, 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 the relevant thing I suppose is that for half of those people with an anxiety disorder or depression, um, half of them don't actually seek any help. Um, they just battle along themselves, you know, they think and uh, you know I can get over this and naturally and particularly for people with cancer because you know they have been through a pretty challenging time um, with the diagnosis the treatment um, and all the things that comes with it the effects of the surgery etc so um, they're fairly recent statistics um, and so with prostate cancer um, a lot of men or when I say a lot of men a number of men might um, develop, say, for example, an anxiety disorder. And that's the most common health problem. And it is a serious condition, uh, and 14% of the population are affected. Uh, this is just the general population. Um, obviously, we'd have higher numbers with people that have got cancer or um, a chronic illness. Recently, I gave a talk at the um, Taramurra Uniting Church. Um, I've not religious at all, and there I am up at the pulpit in the church. I felt really bad. Um, I felt a bit of a hypocrite. The roof still Pardon? The roof is still there. The roof? Oh, the roof! <laughs> yes. Yeah. Anyway, um, but that was for the prost prostate, uh, not prostate, Parkinson's, um, New South Wales. And what was really sad about that is one of my close friends has um, developed Parkinson's in the last few years and is in a very bad way. And um, uh, yeah, so, you know, it's just, anyway, anxiety. Um, there are many different anxiety disorders you can see there. People who have a serious traumatic event um, have to deal with anxiety disorder and some of that anxiety um, stays with them for many years. Um, so much so that many people can't even get out of the house. You know, I've met lots of people that have an anxiety disorder that literally can't get out of the house and um, that, that is a, a serious disorder. And then there's just generalised anxiety disorder, like the least little thing, you know, will set somebody off and being incredibly anxious. Um, even might it mean going to a, an event or a function or um, meeting somebody for the first time, going to the doctor, you know, all those things can create anxiety, but a disorder is something that can be overwhelming and when it impacts on somebody's ability to function, um, normally then it becomes a disorder and only really a, a, a trained medical person can detect or diagnose you know when just a feeling anxious about things and obviously if you had cancer if you've had treatment or if you're caring for somebody with cancer you can be anxious you can and uh, 
In, in fact, of all the research, because one of the things, all the stuff we produce at the Cancer House in my time, and I'm sure it's continuing, or it is continuing, was based on evidence and research. We, and we, everything we did, we did in partnership with the universities. And the interesting thing about um, this uh, uh, anxiety and depression is that it, one would expect that the patient with cancer had the highest levels of anxiety and depression. But for those of you here who are caring for somebody, you will know that you can be credibly anxious and depressed. And in fact, carers, as we call carers, had higher levels of anxiety and depression than somebody with cancer. That's all types of cancers we looked at. So um, that was, you know, that was something, and therefore we, we needed to provide a lot of resources that would help carers and to understand that this is a common occurrence. And, and how to get over it. Um, so that's anxiety in a, in a nutshell. And depression is something else again. Um, sometimes people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm sad and I'm, I'm grieving and, you know, I've lost something. And that, that's, that's, natu that's a natural progression of how people would feel if, if um, they're feeling sad or they're grieving. But if it goes on for more than a couple of weeks or more, um, and that means if they've actually felt really not wanting to engage in their normal activities, not interested in things, not interested in their external environment or even their family, or they don't want to do the things that they, you know, found enjoyable, like being in the garden, or they just can't really function for two weeks or more. Um, that can um, be a classic example of somebody who's depressed doesn't necessarily mean to say they are, but they do need to see a doctor. So, you know, if, if, you, if you've got a depression like this that goes on for more than two weeks and you're feeling really down and it is affecting your life and the way you function, then you really need to go and um, talk to your doctor. Uh, I, I'm assuming you've all got a good GP that you talk to? Yes. Yes? Yeah, so that's really important. You know, a good GP knows you, knows the family, knows your situation and can really see when you know you change. You know, a lot of people do this doctor shopping stuff. They don't get the, the right things that they need from a doctor, so they go and see another one or they go and see another one. And what that means is, you know, you've got to tell your whole story again, but not only that, that person doesn't really know you or know your family, whereas a GP, I mean, obviously, some GPs have, well, you talked about boards, but this I'll just um, be quiet, uh, go a sidestep. I do tend to go off the track a bit, so you might have to wave a flag, but this is really relevant because one of the things, for the last 12 years I've been on the medical board of New South Wales, now called the Medical Council, and on that board we see all the mad, bad and the sad doctors, in other words the ones, you know, who are depressed themselves, and a lot of doctors are, or have a mental illness, or take drugs, or whatever sexually abuse their patients. I mean, you, things you read about in the paper, well, I've seen it all. Um, so you get a bit of a jaundiced view about that. But the one thing I learned from that is that doctors do are very isolated. They, there's a lot of pressure on them to keep up a stiff upper lip. They go through the same traumas that we do in our lives. You know, our marriages break up or we lose somebody or, but they don't like to talk about it. So they're the worst ones that actually tell somebody how they're feeling. Um, so you may find a doctor that's going through a stressful time and um, you know I'm not advocating that you don't change your doctors if that doctor's not giving you the support and the advice that you need because some doctors fear about retiring so they they work for a long time and you know they get dementia like everybody else and they they lose their they don't attend all the meetings you know so you've got to find a doctor and be happy with your doctor. And if, if you're not, and you feel that doctor's not up to speed, then you, you know you really need to find out from friends or colleagues or whoever, um, somebody who's good. Because you know I know there are GPs and there are GPs, but if you found a good GP, you've, you know, you're lucky and, and that's great. But that doesn't always happen um, for everybody. So in terms of the depression symptoms, they do vary enormously, but um, Men will obviously just descri often describe the physical symptoms um, first. Um, 
but it also affects thoughts and feelings and it certainly affects somebody's behavior. So it's more likely that the person's loved one, partner, family would be the first to see a change in their behavior and may think, I think that person, you know, I think he's depressed. Um, now, the other thing about depression, especially in older people, looking around, you're not all old. <laughs> this is a young group. <laughs> okay, this is a young group. Okay, but you will get old. There's nothing's, nothing's more certain than that. We all do get old. Um, but it, because um, somebody's old, they're more likely to be, um, it's more likely to be diagnosed for something else, the depression, or mistaken for other things. Um, but it's certainly associated with uh, risk factors such as chronic physical illness, or you know having had a, a diagnosis of cancer and be treated, and the, the side effects of that treatment. Uh, obviously, that can um, cause depression or gr grief. Uh, now, grief can be grieving what you've lost in terms of your physical capabilities and that's very real and I think it's very important for um, men with prostate cancer if they lose sexual function and that is a loss and there is a certain amount of grieving about that and you know I don't think anybody should underestimate what that's like and uh, recognize that it can actually trigger depression and does. Um, and also the other thing is for people in residential care, it's probably no surprise to you, um, but they have much higher levels of anxiety, depression than other older people who are not in institutional care. Okay, now I just want to talk briefly about men and depression. Um, one in eight men and one in five women, so more women than men, uh, suffer from or experience depression in their lifetime. So that's, I mean, that's good for men, not so good for women. <laughs> um, but they're, they're the statistics. Um, now, w for men who, who are depressed, they're more likely um, than women to recognise and describe the physical symptoms of depression. They're, they're more aware, perhaps, and more likely to describe it. Um, they, but they might, the way they describe it is more about, you know, they're feeling tired, um, they're irritable, they're angry. They don't name it necessarily, but they can talk quite happily about their physical side. Um, and rather than actually saying, look, I'm feeling depressed or I'm feeling down or I'm feeling miserable or I'm feeling sad, you know, they're less likely to do that than describe the more physical things. You know, they might have a sore back or they might be getting headaches or they might be, you know, a whole range of things, but actually they're depressed, but they're not going to name it. Um, and if they don't name it to their doctors, then it often gets, might get overlooked, especially if somebody's known, if you've known your doctor for a long time, you know, you have a, hail fellow well met, how are you going doc? I'm oh, well, how are you going mate? Um, that sort of a chat. Um, and you know, says, oh well I'm feeling a bit sore, so I'm a little this in the back, but doesn't actually say, well, I'm actually feeling, you know, really miserable, you know, I'm really down, I really, that doesn't, that's often a lot harder for men, most men, this is all gener generalities here, but it's a lot harder for most men than it is, say, for women. In a way, it's society's sanction. Uh, you know, women are sanctioned by society to enable them to be, um, you know, miserable. Um, they have to put up with, you know, when they're younger with their periods and they can get away with saying, I'm feeling really down because I've got my period, which a lot of women did, do. Um, but men tend to be, you know, talk more about other things than um, actually the fact that they're um, depressed. Now, the other thing, of course, as you would expect, for people with a chronic illness, um, depression and, um, is, is, is quite high in, in, um, statistically. Um, so if you have a chronic physical condition that's not going to go away, um, maybe getting worse, you know, something like arthritis or, you know, something like that, or because of your, the, the surgery you've had, it's caused a condition and that's always going to be with you, um, there obviously that can make people quite depressed. Um, and it also can make somebody feel isolated, and that's what's so good about these groups, particularly for men and men's sheds. The other, th I'm a real fan of the men's sheds. Anybody go to the men's sheds? Not this group, no. 
can't fit it in. You're all too busy. But I have seen, and I know men, and I've been to talk to some of the men shed people, and you know, like it's just fantastic to see men when they're doing something with their hands and they're creating, building something, and they get to know the person, and they just say, well, you know, I'm having a hard time, mate. You know, this, that, whatever's going on. Maybe they're ill or whatever. But you know, it's really good, and that's the benefit of a group like this, because you all know each other. Or most of you, I imagine, of how long have you been? What's long? How long have you been meeting? Long time. Long, long time. Fifteen years plus ago. Fifteen years plus ago. But has anybody been here in the 15 years? No, but, but that's... There is, there is one guy, but he's not here. Yes, it changes. But, I mean, that's a solid group. That's a solid support. And, you know, for, the, for you guys with the prostate cancer experience and for your partners, I mean, it's a wonderful supportive environment and it's, you know, can only benefit, um, you know, in, in the long term. Um, but, you know, often a chronic illness can make people isolated, um, especially if they live alone. A lot of older people do live alone um, and a lot of people have, div you know, divorced, separated, lose a partner and um, with a chronic physical um, condition, it can be really, really isolating and particularly for older people. Um, there's a story that I just remember just so clearly. Um, you'll, I think, I know Rosie King has spoken at the various um, prostate cat. Yeah, well, she she told me a story that, um, and she might have, she she's used it. <laughs> no, wrong Rosie. Sorry. All right, Dr. Rosie King. She did. Many years, Many years ago. Yeah, I don't think she's doing much now as she used to, but I have spoken with her on different forums and things. And But she told me this lovely story, which is the importance of touch. Well, not me. She told this a particular group. Um, was that she used to, when she worked as a GP, she used to go around and there was a lovely old lady in some, you know, inner city uh, house, little house, and lived alone, very old. And, and she'd go and visit her and... Um, you know, one day uh, she sort of said, oh, do you mind if, you know, went to the door, she said, do you mind if I just hold your hand, you know, hold you just for a minute? And Rosie said, oh, no, not at all. And she said, well, do you know that the only person that I get to touch is just briefly is the paper boy when he drops the change in my hand and I don't touch anybody else at all. And, you know, that's sort of Rosie that's stuck in her head and she thought, well, this is so important. And if you think about it, somebody living alone, if they don't have a pet, yeah, you want to ask a no, question? No, I was just going to say I heard a similar uh, comment from a lady that lived in a very, very large retirement village up here at Castle Hill. Yeah. And she went to church on Sundays because the minister shook her hand and gave her a cuddle and she said, he is the only person that touches her. Oh, that's and it's exactly the same as exactly what you said. You just don't realise how no. isolating it can be. It, it, it yeah. can be incredibly isolating. Yeah, yeah. And that's why that people that live alone, you know, a pet can be just so important. You know, having that pet that wags its tail or meows or something when you, you know, you come in and, and then actually, um, you know, it can be really... And, and for certain, certainly for somebody with a chronic illness, um, it's very important. Um, the other thing is it's hard to maintain when you have a chronic illness, you're not feeling well, um, you often don't maintain those um, connections, you know, it's always an effort to go out perhaps and you might, friends drop off. And the other thing, friends often feel fairly, um, they don't quite know how, how much to ask, what sort of questions, what they should say. So people, although cancer is not what it used to be because, I mean, way back, uh, I think in my parents' time, um, you know, people didn't talk about cancer. You know, uh, I'm, I'm doing res family research here, history. I go into the State Library quite a lot now. And, um, you know, I knew that my um, great-grandmother died at 47 with breast cancer. Um, but uh, I didn't really know much about it at all because it was always called something else. But anyway, um, I, I just had to sort of find out what exactly happened and not that I did manage to find a lot, but that's important. Um, so 
people with a chronic illness recovery from if they are depressed um, recovery can be a little bit more difficult because with the chronic illness it is you know it is hard to get on top of things you know it, it, you can get feel down a lot of the time um, just having a diagnosis of a disease like cancer um, can trigger depression and anxiety in somebody who's vulnerable. You know, people have get depressed at all different times of their lives. You know, somebody might have experienced depression once before and then having a diagnosis of cancer, particularly prostate cancer, it can suddenly trigger off another episode of depression or anxiety. Um, there's also the issue around adapting if you're still working or just adapting to life, living with um, a, a, a disease like cancer and speci specifically prostate cancer. Um, and then because um, you are anxious and or depressed, the reduction in, bra in brain chemicals can actually um, make you have a lot of mood changes and often that's the way depression can be diagnosed by a family member or is, is noting there's a bit sudden mood changes and the person has gone from not being terribly moody but all of a sudden being moody and being not really wanting to talk about what's going on or avoiding avoiding the conversations. Um, yeah, sure. Can anxiety or, or depression lead to forgetfulness or memory loss or mm. that style of thing as well? Is that usual to go with it? Yeah, because when somebody's depressed, well, I, well, and and anxious, you can't. The, that person can't really think clearly. They really cannot think, and they find it really hard to make decisions. Um, they find may find being in a crowd or you know just you know a whole lot of things but memory can be really affected because they can't just can't think clearly because some of the thoughts they're having the self you know talk is so overwhelming that they actually just can't clear their head enough to think properly so yes you yes it is it is an issue um, and the other thing is different behavioral things that happen things like they might drink more because um, alcohol's, you know, really good. Uh, it makes you sort of forget about your troubles for a while. And if you drink too much of it, it can be very problematic. Um, getting really irritable and frustrated with just the minor sort of things, our all day-to-day -day things, you know, the mower breaks down or the, something, ha something happens. Um, something minor um, can actually trigger a irritability and frustration that and a level of anger that probably ha that person hasn't expressed before. So their partner, if they have one, is usually the first one to notice that they're more easily angered and maybe they start swearing more or they get irritable and they might even become argumentative, which they hadn't before. And they're very sensitive to criticism from their partner or family. And the other thing is sleep dis disturbances. And we all have, I think as we get older, we often have sleep problems, it's a bit hard to sleep. We don't sleep as long, we wake up, we can't get back to sleep, you toss and turn, yeah. try getting all different sorts of pillows. I hate to tell you how many pillows I've tried. Everyone tells me this wonderful pillow that means I won't wake up with a sore neck in the morning. It doesn't work. Um, so sleep disturbances are very common. And also, as I said earlier, complaints about physical health. Um, they're, they're more complaints than you would just expect um, from somebody who's who's aging or has had a, an illness and moodiness locking themselves up in their study or um, just avoiding the family avoiding the conversation getting up after dinner and you know retiring and well I mean a lot of people do anyway sit in front of the television and um, don't want to talk go to sleep, go to sleep. <laughs> yes I know <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're a swimmer, are you? Okay. How how much do you swim? How far do you swim? In the morning, I don't go by. I go by minutes. Fifty minutes. Fifty, freestyle. That's pretty good. No wonder you're asleep. I'd be asleep by lunchtime. <laughs> oh, really? Wow, fifty minutes. Oh well, that's really good. That's good. And does that lift your mood? If you're down? Oh, I feel good after Yeah, of so course. Yeah. Well, you've got those endorphins happening, haven't you, from the exercise, the physical, the physicality. I think physical things are good. I mean, I walk every morning, like every morning. It's become an absolute um, 
addiction which is quite healthy, except the, the coffee that I have at Wurunga Village, at, at one of the incentives to get me out of bed to go on the walk is probably not so good. But I think walking is very good too. I don't know how many of you like going for a walk, but just going for a walk, clearing your head is great, or you know, do, as you do exercise is fantastic. Um, the other thing is um, a certain amount of recklessness and risk taking. Some people, um, when they get anxious or depressed, will do some rather bizarre things that they haven't done before. Um, some might want to get their stimulation from doing things that are risky um, because they're feeling down and they think if they do this or try this um, that it will um, boost their mood and they'll feel better. And that it may do that, it just depends <laughs> what, you know, how risky and what it is. <laughs> Um, I gave a talk um, about, uh, oh, it was probably nearly two years ago now, at, for Seniors Week at the DY, um, DY RSL, you know that big, uh, a huge one? Anyway, it was absolutely packed. I wasn't the only speaker, it was a whole series of talks. But I was giving it, um, and I was talking about um, sexuality and ageing, because that's a, you know, fa a, a topic that I'm very familiar with and speak about often and um, as I was talking I was put a slide up about uh, Viagra and you know talked about that and I noticed um, about mid oh, about six rows back a very very nice striking looking couple and when I started talking about that uh, the um, they got up and left and I thought oh well that's all right I've, obviously that's not something that they're interested in and they need to go but at morning tea the wife came back and she said look I just wanted to apologize to you um, she said look we've, I've just been through a terrible time with my husband he's, he's, he's got Alzheimer's he's a retired university professor he, they live on the northern beaches he um, has early dementia and anyway, the story evolved that what happened was he, um, she could leave him during the day for a while, but she'd gone off shopping. Anyway, he took himself off to their local GP or their, their family GP and said he wanted to go on Viagra. So um, the GP gave him a prescription, which I thought was a bit off considering he had Alzheimer's. But I have a, had a big argument with a very good friend of mine who's a GP and said, no, that he did the right thing because that man is his patient. The wife's not the patient. She didn't come in as the patient. He did. Anyway, cut a long story short, what happened? He took it. Then he obviously started to feel a bit sprightly. So he um, walked down to the local taxi rank and asked where the nearest prostitute was, who was up at uh, Warrywood or somewhere. And anyway, so off he went with his $50. And he kept doing that for a while. And um, then apparently he just told his wife one day, he said that's what he'd been doing and he doesn't want to do it anymore. He got sick of it. But look, I mean, it's a sad story, but it's a true story. But it just shows, um, you know, that the GPs are not infallible, but, you know, strange things happen. And uh, when people get anxious, when people get depressed, they may think that certain things are going to make them feel a heck of a lot better and it might be detrimental to their relationships. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that does happen, but I'm just saying, um, or, or should happen, you know, is a common thing, but you know, it does happen. So there's recklessness and risk-taking associated with depression, that somebody might do something that's totally out of character, um, that can be really risky. It could be driving, you know, a sports car or, you know, diving from great heights or it could be a whole lot of things. Um, the other thing is avoidance, a phobia about um, objects or situations or wanting to just, you know, not step on cracks, that's a, but you know, things like that that become a bit of a phobia or, so they're quite bizarre things that happen and, and, and you as that person's partner, the partners who are here tonight, they're more likely to pick that up as a change in behaviour. Yep. That's all right. That's good. Is that working? Yes. You talk about recklessness and, and what that chap did and things like that. Yeah. Uh, 
Is there any link between uh, midlife crisis in men? I mean, I must confess I strung that out for 10 or 15 years as a good excuse. <laughs> but in all seriousness, is there any connection between midlife crisis in men, you know, particularly the yes. going out with the secretary or the sports car, and yes. depression? Is there any link between the two? Um, I, I can't tell you the exact evidence uh, because I don't, but I, I, from what I've read, yes, there is. Yeah, there is. Because you think about that, you're depressed. Um, maybe you, you, you haven't been the whiz kid that you always thought you were going to be, you know, in terms of business or your career or whatever, or even in your family situation. Um, you're feeling down, you can get depressed, so you need some stimulation and whatever that might be. Um, it's quite common in older men, um, well, particularly, well, even I think men in their 50s, you know, their potency sort of dropping a bit, their maybe not, hasn't been as successful as life's, you know, it's all, it's been a bit of a chore. Um, they're not really enjoying their life and so they can slip into a depression and think it's going to be better if I do such and such. So yes, yes, yeah, it, it, it is, it's certainly linked, there's a definite, definite link. Um, the other thing, obviously somebody won't attend social events, they don't want to go out, uh, they just want to stay home. Um, they have to be dragged, kicking and screaming to sort of functions and things. Um, and also their, their friends, they can withdraw from their friends. And as I've already alluded to, the appetite for food might go up or down, and the same with sex, up or down. Um, Prostate cancer is a different issue because obviously there's More the... <laughs> well, I wouldn't dare say that, but you said it. <laughs> but yeah, of course, a absolutely. And you know, like, let's call a spade a spade. That's, 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 a, that's a huge thing to deal with. I mean, it's, it is, a, you know, like it is something that is forever present. And um, obviously, Men, all men re react in different ways to that, and um, but it is—it's a huge thing, and, and that is why a lot of men do get quite depressed because you know, knowing that that's the situation, and it's not really going to change that much, unless there's a penile implant. Um, yes, so that's right, and I don't actually—I'm a bit, bit out of that now, but I don't know what the incidence is of the number of men who have penile implants. Maybe one of you could tell me. Um, they're quite common, and yeah. uh, we've got a few people in the group here that have yes, got them. Yes. Um, I actually sat at a dinner once with uh, the rep from that, and they've got something like over 90% satisfaction rate. Good. And as I say, with any product in any market, that's a very that's high very satisfaction good. rate. Yes. Um, they're extremely reliable, and the men that have got them think they're terrific, better that's than right. when they were 18 years old. First time, every time, for as long as they like. Fantastic. So uh, they're not uncommon now yes, and uh, yes. hugely successful. Yes. Well, I, I can only remember, yes, well, I was, as I said, when I was at family planning, obviously we were involved in all of that. Um, and uh, we actually did... I took part in a DVD with a fantastic d GP who was out at, I don't know where he was, out at Penrith or somewhere. And we did lots of talks on that. And um, we did one on prostate cancer and him talking to the, and that, that man in the, in the DVD had just met a new partner, you know, a younger partner. And his wife had died some years ago. And all of a sudden it was really important to him. So in the DVD, we had him showing what all the things that could be done and you know, talked about pain, and so it was an education video. So it's very important. It's very important. Yeah, and I mean, it's great that that these things work, and that there's plenty of them, and then people are actually going and asking for them. Yeah, no, it's it's great. Um, so really, I've talked about all of that, and. Um, I'll move on. So in terms of seeking help, there's lots of, if somebody is depressed or anxious, um, obviously the psychological treatments include cognitive behavioural therapy, which can be d done by a, a, a psychologist, or interpersonal therapy, where you're working very closely with a, a therapist or a, a psychologist, counsellor, or even a psychiatrist if, if that's needed. I, I have a different view about psychiatrists though, um, but uh, that's, that's just my bias. Uh, but I shouldn't say that, I shouldn't say that. The only reason I say that is because I've seen so many psychiatrists before the medical board. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I'm really 
have a jaundiced view there, sorry, I mustn't hit the mic. Um, so obviously some people do need to see a psychiatrist, there are plenty of good ones. Um, medication, antidepressants, well that you, you do need to go and see a doctor and you need to be go to a doctor who knows what they're doing with the antidepressants because there are some that work and some that don't and it's very important to get on something that actually works for you. So that's important. And then there's all the self-care tips of if you're feeling depressed or anxious. Um, things like listen to your doctor about tips to help you sleep well at night and obviously exercise in the day really helps. And remaining active, whether it's a men's shared hobbies, exercise, interests, whatever. Relaxation techniques. Has anybody experienced doing relaxation breathing? Yeah, yeah it's, it's wonderful. Yep. That's right, the meditation, I know it well. <laughs> oh, I'm glad, oh, that's really good. I'm happy to hear that, yep, that's we good. To a lot of patients coming through Fantastic, really yeah, no, we're thrilled with that one. Um, that's good, I um, thought it, yeah, it's been out for a while, but it's good, it's a good one. It's really good, yeah. Um, and obviously what you eat, health, eating healthy and eating uh, nutritious foods. Um, there's a tendency if you are anxious or depressed not to eat properly. Maybe eat a bit of junk food for sort of satisfy you, make you feel a quick hit. Um, so it's really important to eat healthy and nutritious foods and obviously limit your alcohol intake. Um, and obviously discussions about treatment options are important to have with your doctor. You know, not everybody needs to go on antidepressants. There's lots of other things in the um, cognitive behavioural therapy area that can really help. And obviously that most of you will have families who are worried about you, um, want to help you, so certainly accept help from them. And uh, try and do something in your day that gives you pleasure, um, whether it's, you know, it's looking at a beautiful view or just seeing something growing in the garden or whatever you like to do. Um, and the, the key message is really that anxiety and depression are not a normal part of ageing, but they are certainly associated with a diagnosis of cancer, obviously, because that's a huge thing. And, and, and the after effect of the treatment um, obviously can make people anxious and depressed. But there are, they are health problems and they're not weaknesses. So, you know, where men might tend to see, some men might tend to see these as a weakness, it's got nothing to do with weakness. It's definitely a medical condition and it's triggered by something that, you know, is beyond our control. And the good thing is that people speak about it more, like all the great stuff, and you'll have stuff to take home that from Beyond Blue. I can't speak highly enough of them. They're a really good organisation. They are making a difference, I'm sure. And um, that these things are treatable and information supports out there. Plenty of it. Well, you, you know from your own experience that Cancer Council, for example, with cancer information, was well, the same with mental illness and mental health. There's lots of information out there. And there's a lot of really good people. And those are the co contacts um, that are helpful. There's a men's line. Um, oh, the, that was for the Parkinson's group I did. Um, but Beyond Blue website's really good. And all these things are very, very helpful. So. I hope that's been of interest and I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Um, but I hope that I've sort of put it in a, in a context for you. And I guess the message is to take home that um, depression and anxiety are common and they're not a weakness at all. And given what you have been through in your uh, treatment and after journey, um, it is quite common and it's easily fixed. Do we have any questions? David. With antidepressant drugs, uh, once you start them, do you, have you then got to continue them? Is it one of these things that you become dependent on? No, not necessarily. It just, just depends. I mean, I'm, this is very much a generalisation because I'm not a specialist in this area, but from my observation, um, there, there's a bit of a trial and error period with them to find something that suits and I think generally people, the doctors would start off at a very low dose of something or something mild and not go for the whiz-bang ones that, um, that you know, something that will um, and there's a sort of a period of testing to see what effect it's having on your mood and so I think most people would uh, prescribe lower doses of something rather than go for a big bang. But that 
having said that, if somebody is depressed, say if somebody tried to jump off a building or something like that and kill themselves, that's a whole different ball game. Um, you know, they might need a whole range, a concoction of things. But generally, no, you wouldn't have to stay stay on them forever. They often are just a short-term thing. And and that's when it's important to, to talk to the doctor, whoever you're um, prescribing, who's prescribing for you, it would be a doctor, is about what the situation is, what the issue is, and, 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 and that doctor might refer you to um, a psychologist to find out really what is going on, that you, you can actually do something other than take antidepressants in terms of, you know, thinking positively and all those things, exercise or whatever. So it's nothing to be sort of fearful about. And it's certainly, you know, as I say, it's not a weakness. It might be just a, what's needed in a short window of time along with other things. Yes. Yeah. Can I ask one? I know I've spoken too much tonight. <laughs> My wife will say that's not unusual. That's all right, Grant. <laughs> you can. Um, what's <laughs> cognitive behavioural therapy? Okay. Well, cognitive behavioural therapy, as, as I know it, and as I said, it's not my field, but it is about um, talking to a psychologist about what, what, what are your thoughts, what, what, what's making you feeling, feel anxious and depressed, and then learning how to sort of reframe, reframe the way you look at things and reframe your behaviour so that you, using the power of your mind, can actually overcome what it is and learn techniques to change a behaviour that's going to lift your mood, basically. So it's a way of learning how to overcome the negative thoughts and think more positively and work out what you can do to minimise that happening as often. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good technique because it's not—it's drug-free, yeah. and um, it's—it's—it's it's, it's something that you can do. It's something you can learn to do, concentrate on, and from my experience of people that have had it, it—you it, know—it it can work very well. Uh, if you've experienced anxiety in your family, you know, you haven't. I know of family. Oh, families that have. Yes, um, you sort of learn a certain way of behaving and, and things that you're going to be anxious about. You know, you learn that from your, your parents in a way, you know. I mean, parents, you know, like we all have certain phobias about things, or oh, not all of us, but many people do. Or if there's certain ways of behaving in a family and getting anxious about things like, well, I'll just give an example, um, Christmas. <laughs> Christmas is a classic example of families and some members of families working themselves up into in a state of anxiety because we, you know, society says that we've all got to be happy at Christmas. All the families have got to get on well together and now we've got blended and curdled families and everyone's got to love each other and usually, of course, what happens? Somebody gets too much to drink at Christmas and then tells somebody what they think and then it's a disaster. So people can get anxious about um, anything like that or even driving going out of the house going shopping a lot of things and, and some of that can be uh, something that's a bit of a hangover for because a lot of people when they go into therapy and start talking to their therapist they get asked you know what happened in your family what how did you know, when this happened what was the parents and you often you find that it's the what you observed as a child that happened in your family is that you, you're repeating that. Is it always that or is it more likely in our family and these people have been really, there's a, a, a progression of depression, serious depression. Oh well depression. Self-harming and all that. Yes. Is that, is that more genetic than learned behaviour? Oh I think you could argue that. I, I, I'm not an expert so I'm not going to really, I'm not going to really say about that one. I'm just saying there are a lot of things we we um, absorb from our families and from growing up in a family, in a dysfunctional family, perhaps where there is a mental illness. I can give you, I'll just give you an example of, of somebody I know uh, then that maybe that's a good idea. Um, this person grew up um, in the country area on a farm and um, her family, she had a, a sister she's, and um, a brother and their mother was diagnosed very early in her 30s with schizophrenia. 
Now they're a, they're a, a, a well known in their local farming area. They have long standing history in the you know the, the area, and of course in those days the mother was shunted off to have shock terrible mm. shock treatment. Um, there was all kinds of things that happened where she did bizarre things. The father, who's a farmer, brought up the three children virtually, you know, on his own because the mother wasn't capable. But the impact on those children has been enormous. Um, and a, a one of the impacts that I have noted, because I know the family, is this thing about privacy, that you never really tell anyone whatever happens in the home is private. You, you know not to just arrive unannounced because that's not what you do. And so, you know, though they grew up in an anxious sort of thing and so they are affected, not with a mental illness, but just, you know, a very much there, a bit of a phobia about you don't tell anybody anything too much about what's going on in the family. So, and I'm sure that would be handed down in the generations. <laughs> Depression is a different... Yeah, well, depression is a mental illness. Yes, depression is a mental illness and, you know, it's a combination of a whole lot of things. It can be chemical imbalance, it can be traumas, it can be a whole lot of things. I mean, I think there is, though, some, uh, like schizophrenia, I think there is, there's a genetic sort of thing there that's a possibility, so... But just because somebody in your family has been depressed or has schizophrenia or something, it doesn't mean to say that it's going to happen. <laughs> I don't mean your family. I mean in a family, one's family. One's generally family. speaking. Yeah. Kendra, thank you so much for, for your talk this, uh, this evening. And I, I think it's touched on some very interesting things. I mean, we all know the value of carers for prostate cancer patients. Oh, absolutely. And I think we all understand that sometimes the carers worry more than the patient they do. in a lot of instances. Well, that's what the research shows, mm. that, that they do. Yeah. They actually do. Yeah. take on a whole you know, burden of, you know, and become anxious and, and depress themselves because yeah. they've got to be the one that's bright and cheerful all the time. That's right. And it's really hard. <laughs> oh, do we fellas get really grumpy and growly and down? No, it's not that you yes. get grumpy. It's just that they're worried about you because they, you know, they love you. <laughs> that's right. But uh, it's very interesting. And also it was very interesting to, uh, to note that fellows don't go to the doctor and say I'm depressed or I'm even sad or anything like that. That's right. They go and uh, tell them that they've got a pain or an ache or something like that and uh, yeah, we know we're a little unusual but that was a very interesting no, uh, because I, I think it, it is the way you are, hard. the way yeah. you're brought up really it's the way, you know, you've got a lot of expectations mm. on, on, on always being strong and right. you know, <coughs> in control yeah. and you know, with, when you get an illness or you're not in control and it's very hard that's why the men sheds once again you know, when you're banging away on a nail or whatever you're doing, you can actually start to say, look, I'm really worried, you know, mate, about yeah. this. And, and it, it's because you've got the, the, the camaraderie right. to, and you feel that you're a supportive group. That's right. Whereas if you wouldn't go to your necessary to your neighbour and say, oh, you know, I'm depressed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you very, very much. I think that it was a very, very interesting talk and, and covered some different areas. Uh, and it's very good that anxiety is now linked with depression. Yes. I mean, a few years ago it was never mentioned. No, so it's a, it's a, it, it is very serious if you know, someone has anxiety. It can have a huge impact on their yeah, life and the does. way they can function. That's right, it does. Mm. So thank you very much again. Would you please thank Kendra for a wonderful thank you. story? Thank you.